Um, so our objectives are um, to discuss the general management approaches to all cause diaper dermatitis, um, or to discuss the various antifungal options that uh, are available, um, to discuss what things could alter management and that we need to be looking out for, and a few differential diagnoses that we need to think about when um, we are dealing with candida diaper dermatitis. Um, so there's an acronym, a famous acronym, um, um, named ABCDE, which is um, really easy. And this is effective for any cause of diaper dermatitis. So when we think about um, management approaches that are helpful for all cause diaper dermatitis, um, then we all need to be familiar with this acronym, ABCDE. And uh, what it stands for is air, barrier, uh, cleansing, diaper, and education. And we're going to talk about um, each of these in a little detail in a bit. So let's talk about air. Um, so in communities where babies uh, run around uh, without being uh, dressed with either di uh, diapers, nappies, or any underpants, and they're just running around in the community or around the house, then the rates of um, diaper dermatitis are actually um, close to non-existent and that's because there is nothing um, really occluding uh, the diaper area um, immediately the baby uh, passes a motion or um, um, urinates they are cleaned up and so they are not really in contact with um, urine or stool for a long time to irritate them um, so one of the very effective ways uh, of treating all-cause diaper dermatitis, and that includes candida diaper dermatitis, is just to air. It's to remove the nappy, it's to remove the diaper and let the baby run around in as loose clothing as you can find. Um, acceptable to even have them running around with nothing because it airs the area. And the second thing is to work on the barrier. And by this we mean... Um, so we said, we talked about the impaired um, skin function being a risk factor for getting candida uh, diaper dermatitis and all you do with the barrier is improve that. So you're improving um, the barrier between um, the very sensitive skin and um, urine or stool contents that might be in the, in the diaper. And that might mean applying agents um, um, that improve uh, the, the moisture um, content of the area, applying a barrier between, often these would be um, Vaseline um, or um, some other um, oily substance um, that's really reducing the contact between the bare skin and the contents of um, of urine and stool that the baby might come into contact with. And the third part is cleansing. Um, and cleansing means uh, often with water. Um, and we try not to use soap or other cleansing products because you know various uh, bathing products will actually further impair the, uh, barrier, uh, the, um, the barrier function of the skin depending on what they have. So you just clean them with uh, warm water, that, that would be it. And all you're doing is you're, you're removing, you're removing the content, any, rem any remaining contents of urine or stool and trying to have them as into contact, um, trying to have them in contact with the skin for as short a time as possible. And the other thing is diapers. So there's been discussions about diaper, um, papers written about diapers, uh, cloth diapers better than disposable diapers. Is there a type of diaper that's better than the other one? Um, and um, there's a lot of discussions about what to do and what not to do. And we will talk about what the evidence shows in a bit. Um, then education, it's talking to the moms uh, before the diaper dermatitis happens. These are the times when you're likely to um, telling her these are the times when your baby is likely to get a diaper dermatitis, when they are having diarrhea, when you're weaning the diet. If they are sensitive to one product, you need to switch um, to something else. Education, education, education. So when this is employed most of the times, then you'll be able to deal with all cause of diaper dermatitis and uh, prevent um, that going on to become uh, candida di diaper dermatitis in some cases. Now there are a few things which could alter how you manage, um, which might make you want to go a step further from the ABCDE approach. Um, and one of them is to consider and look for bacterial super infection. So you have to remember that um, not only would uh, contact irritant diaper dermatitis uh, 
have a, 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 a fungal super infection, in this case candida, it can also be a bacterial super infection and that will need to be treated differently. The other thing is to look for oral candidiasis. So if this candida um, that the baby has is not just in the perineal region, it's also in um, the mouth, then your management options are going to change. Um, and when you think of a bacterial super infection or when you're not sure, then you need to be taking a, a swab, um, especially then to be able to rule it out because that's something you do not want to miss. Um, so the mainstay of therapy is thankfully topical antifungals which are readily available and most of the times um, cheap. And what we have is the imidazoles. Um, in this case you can do either clotrimazole, uh, miconazole, ketoconazole or bifonazole. And these will be applied twice daily for 7 to 10 days and the cure rates are really high, about 50 to 68 percent. And when this is accompanied with general measures to um, prevent diaper dermatitis, then it tends to resolve most of the time. Now, um, nistatin has also been commonly used, but it's less effective than the imidazoles. And often, it, because it is less effective, if you're using nistatin and in two to three days you don't see a response, then you need to be switching to imidazole. Um, Cyclopyrox also applied twice daily for about seven days, so a slightly shorter duration can also be one of the options that can be used. And um, cetaconazole, which, are, which is a fungicidal agent uh, with long skin durability, so it tends to linger around the skin for a longer time, for up to 72 hours. And it's a really broad spectrum third generation, um, but it's applied and given for a longer time, that's about two weeks, can also be one of the other options that can be used. Now, when do you use oral antifungal agents? Is there a time when you could use oral antifungal agents? So if you find oral thrush or you have concomitant GIT candidiasis, then you need to be approaching this differently and topical agents um, will not be enough. So you will need to be giving an oral agent if this be nistatin or uh, be fluconazole sometimes depending on what you have. Um, this especially happens for babies who are hospitalized, okay, so hospitalized with some sometimes levels of immunosuppression or they've been on antibiotics for a long time and um, they will tend to have oral candidiasis and if they have diapers you will see that uh, manifesting itself as a, um, uh, a diaper, candida diaper dermatitis as well. If you have severe cases, um, so you've tried your topical agents, you've tried your general measures and this is not improving, there is erosions, um, there is ulcerations, baby is really uncomfortable, then you could try oral antifungal agents. And what we typically use is fluconazole at um, a low dose of 3 to 6 milligrams per kg per day. Or the other option would be nystatin at 100,000 international units, about three to four times daily. Um, nystatin can be a little cumbersome to give because of um, the frequency, but it's one of the really good agents that um, can be given orally to work on both oral candidiasis and um, diaper, candida diaper dermatitis. So in addition to antifungals, remove the diaper. So um, this is something we have to keep um, telling the parents we have to remember to do ourselves. Uh, because if you just treat and you do not change the environment, then this baby is going to come back um, with the same infection later. So this eliminates the wet environment, it reduces your irritation and it reduces the contact between skin and the product of stool and urine. Now sometimes steroids can be used um, and what you would do is use a low potency topical steroid for about one to two weeks and this would be really for the very moderate to severe diaper dermatitis that's not responding well. Um, and what it does is it just brings down the inflammation for a bit um, and um, makes the recovery time a little shorter. Um, so if you're seeing candida diaper dermatitis the third or fourth time or it's going on for the third week or for one month and this baby is not getting better, then um, alarm bells need to go on in your, in your mind. So you need to think, is there something else um, going on with this baby um, and what else should I be doing? 
And amongst the things you need to think about is underlying medical conditions, and top on that list is type 1 diabetes, because this is a, a chronic, uh, this is a, uh, can lead to immunosuppression and will make um, the baby more prone to candida infections. Need to be thinking about chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, which sometimes tends to have its onset early on, um, that progresses on. Um, you need to think of cow uh, milk allergy, uh, because that's altering um, the flora, that's making the baby to have diarrhea frequently, um, and all of those are risk factors that um, put the baby at risk of um, candida nappy rash. And you also think, need to think about lactose intolerance. So I think the big thing to remember is if you're not resol if this is not resolving, take a deep history and you need to be thinking of what else could be underlying. And of course, the other thing is an alternative diagnosis. Maybe this is a diaper dermatitis that's not caused by candida. Um, and so what other things might be presenting as um, candida diaper dermatitis? So top on the list is bacterial dermatitis, mainly due to streptococcal and staphylococcal. And how you're able to tell this is usually it's in a bright red in the perianal regions, um, often in slightly older children, one to two years age group. Um, it tends to be tender, very uncomfortable. Baby is really itching, um, so you need to be thinking about that. Um, the other thing is psoriasis. Psoriasis can look like a healing diaper dermatitis, especially around the fall, so scaly, looking silvery. Um, so you tend to, you, you're seeing something that looks like a diaper dermatitis that's resolving, but never resolving completely. Then that could be psoriasis. Um, of course, um, the main one, irritant contact dermatitis, but we've already talked about the things that might help you. Um, then exacerbations of seborrheic dermatitis or atopic dermatitis. So you need to be examining um, the face. You need to be looking at the flex, uh, the flexural re regions of the hands and the feet and the legs um, to look for eczematous lesions. Then scabies and nutritional deficiencies, especially due to zinc. Thankfully, this is um, rare. We will look at uh, images of a couple of these. So we talked about streptococcal infection and what you get is a bright erythema in the perianal region. So if you look at the um, photograph to the left of your screen, um, then you will see that when you uh, part the gluteal folds, then you have these very bright uh, red um, erythematous uh, lesion that's surrounding the perianal region, usually due to beta hemolytic streptococci. And sometimes then you will have bullae um, so that's quite different from the erosions and the maceration that you see with the candida diaper dermatitis. So you will get um, vesicles, you will get uh, fluid filled areas, and these sometimes can be present with impetigo, um, impeti impetigenous lesions. Um, then psoriasis, which you've already talked about. Um, so you could get either the well demarcated bright erythema um, lesions, or more commonly, what you get is uh, well demarcated slivery, uh, glistening, shining plaques uh, within white scales. Um, and that spares the inguinal creases. If you remember, we said that candida diaper dermatitis will involve that. And this will also involve other body areas. So if you're thinking psoriasis, you need to be examining your nails and you need to look at other body parts that would have similar lesions. Um, then irritant contact dermatitis. What's very clear is that um, in this very inflamed um, perianal image, you can see that the folds are spared, okay? So you see the areas that would often be um, um, hidden away when the baby is in the anatomic position, then they do not get the, um, the inflammation. Um, then seborrheic dermatitis, the easiest way to figure if a baby has seborrheic dermatitis or not is actually to examine the scalp, especially when you have an infant because they're going to have cradle cap. Um, sometimes you could also get bits of it on the eyebrow and then you will get this lesion also on um, the diaper region. Um, so a little bit on zinc uh, deficiency because it can be a little dramatic and it's one of those things that are a bit rare. Um, so you can either have it as um, inherited, this is what is known as acrodermatitis enteropathica, this is rare or acquired. 
Um, when um, um, deficiency is severe, presentation is the same for both the inherited and the acquired form. And what you get is a perioral facial dermatitis. What that means is that you have lesions around the, or, um, the orifices. So that could be around the mouth or around the perianal um, um, regions. And young infants uh, are at higher risk of deficiency because they are uh, increased demand for growth. Um, and if they're not getting sufficient diet, then that puts them at um, even more uh, risk of deficiency. And so what you get here is, um, I hope you're able to appreciate the lesions around the mouth um, on that baby. So they are uh, peeling skin. That's actually what you get. Very dramatic peeling of the skin, often around the mouth or around the um, perianal uh, um, region. Um, and that will also involve the folds, um, um, similar to what you would get with the candida diaper dermatitis. You don't typically get pustules um, and papules with, um, um, uh, with zinc deficiency, but sometimes because you're, you, you don't know, you're wondering, is this candida diaper dermatitis that has progressed to the maceration um, stage? or is this um, zinc deficiency, so you're not sure uh, where you're at. Um, but what you get is you get these around the mouth and you get it around the perianal region as well. Um, and this is an image of um, acrodermatitis enteropathica in a white-skinned baby. And you can, tell, you can see that this is a little harder to um, tell the difference between these and candida diaper um, dermatitis. Um, however, you do notice that you don't have satellite lesions with acrodermatitis and teropathica as you would get with candida diaper dermatitis. Um, so let's talk about um, the treatment for um, acrodermatitis and teropathica or, um, or the acquired forms of zinc deficiency is actually replacing zinc and you get dramatic improvement within weeks of starting a baby on treatment. Um, it would also be prudent to do a biopsy at this point or to take a specimen for culture, mycology culture or for microscopy because if you find candida, it doesn't tell you much because you know candida could be a commensal, but if you don't find it, then you think more of um, other alternative diagnosis. So when it comes to prevention, then what should we be doing? Um, so minimizing diaper wear, as we have already talked about, that happens in some communities. Um, frequent diaper changes, um, keep changing. You need to be telling moms of young babies, especially that a baby is likely to be stooling every three to four hours after they are born. And so you need to be changing, you need to be ready to change a diaper that often. Um, then bathing uh, in water, often with uh, baby oil, just to improve the barrier function. Uh, cleansing gently uh, with water um, and using barrier creams, ointments or pastes that are petroleum based or contain zinc oxide or lanolin and all of that is to improve the barrier function between um, the skin and the contents of um, urine or stool. So there's a type of diaper matter? Uh, does it matter what you use? Um, so this is a Cochrane data uh, based systemic review of about 28 studies and what it basically tells us is that there is not enough evidence from uh, good quality randomized control trials to support or refute the use um, of any disposable napkin for the prevention of napkin dermatitis in infants. Um, and so what you have to do is to balance the many consideration in napkin choices that uh, families have to make without any of that evidence. So what basically this tells us is so far we do not have any evidence for cloth diaper, for disposable diaper, for specific forms of uh, disposable uh, diapers to say um, concretely that this is the way to go if you want to avoid um, diaper dermatitis. What about wipes? Does it matter? Should you cleanse with what kind of wipes? Should they have a cleansing solution? Should they be plain water? Uh, should they have some products? Um, and there is no information as well um, on whether single skincare practices such as cleansing, bathing, topical preps can prevent uh, diaper dermatitis. 
Um, so I think this just leaves us where we started, um, that um, air barrier um, cleanse with water should be as good as anything. Um, um, D was diaper, um, frequently change the diaper, and E, education, education, education. So in summary, we've said diaper dermatitis is a common skin condition of infancy. And when we think about it, of the infectious ones, candida diaper dermatitis is the most uh, common of them. We make a diagnosis clinically, and what we do is uh, we prevent it. And so far, there is no single type of diaper, cleansing agent, or barrier cream that has been found to be superior to the others. And parents and healthcare workers have to weigh the options together. Thank you very much for your attention. Music